So the original name, the name of the original book is Visodhimaga, uh, which means the path to purification or the way to purification or purity. Mm, Maga means the path and Visodhi means purification or purity. And this book was written in Pali language. Actually, Pali was not the name of the language. It was the name of a category of Pali literature, uh, which are called texts. <clears throat> and the word Pali is used in contradistinction to the Atagatas or commentaries and uh, Tika's sub-commentaries. But the language was also, uh, the language also came to be known as Pali uh, at a later date. So at our times, the word Pali means both the text and the language in which uh, the texts are recorded. So the texts which comprise of uh, Vinaya, Sota, and Abhidhamma are called Pali, and the commentaries are called Atthakatha, and Tikas are called sub-commentaries. So this book belongs to the category of commentaries, the second category in uh, Pali literature. So the f first there, there, are, there were texts, and then commentaries, and then commentary on commentaries, so they are called sub-commentaries. <coughs> and the author of this book was uh, the venerable Buddha Gosa. Here it is given as Badhanta Charya Buddha Gosa. Actually, the name, his personal name was Buddha Gosa. The word in front of that is Badhanta Badhanta Charya. Uh, Badhanta is like the venerable. And Acharya means teacher, so it means something like the revered teacher, Buddha Gosa. And Buddha Gosa was his personal name. And Buddha means the Buddha, and Gosa means the voice. So Buddha Gosa means the voice of the Buddha. He wrote, or he compiled and edited many commentaries. It, it was not, not the only commentary he wrote. But it seems that this book was written first, and then the other commentaries followed later. But we do not know whether they were published one after the other or mm, more or less at the same time. The other commentaries always refer to Visodhimaga when they have to say something in detail. So uh, we can assume that this book was written first and then the other commentaries came later. And this com the, although this is called a commentary, this book is not a commentary on a particular sutta or a particular collection of sutta or a particular pitaka. It is called a common, common commentary of the text. That means <clears throat> it uh, quotes copiously from the text and then explain these texts in, in uh, great detail. So it is not, not a commentary of any particular soda or collection or bidaka, but it, uh, it is a common commentary to, uh, to all texts. <clears throat> and the author of this book was Bhuta Gosa, and he lived in the 5th century AD. So he was, he was um, about 900 years removed from the Buddha. But the commentaries he wrote were not his own creation, not, not 
uh, his originality because uh, the commentaries existed during the time of the Buddha. And then these commentaries were carried down from generation to generation by word of mouth. <coughs> and later they were written down and then taken to um, Sri Lanka and some of them were translated into Sinhalese and then later in the 5th century uh, the Venerable Buddha Gosa, who was a native of India went to Sri Lanka and worked with the monks at the great monastery in Anuradhapura uh, which was a stronghold of Theravada Buddhism. He got permission to write these commentaries and so he wrote them and offered them uh, to the Sangha there and all were accepted as authentic uh, exegetical literature of the text of Pali. <coughs> and there, there is a commentary to this commentary and we call it sub-commentary. Its, its name was Paramatta Manjusa and it is mentioned in, in, this, in the introduction of this book. And that comment, sub-commentary was written by a teacher or a monk called Dhammapala. I'm not sure to which age he belonged, maybe to the 7th century. <coughs> And the purpose in writing this book was, as the name implies, to show mm, the people the way to purity, the way to purification. And the way to purification means the way to purification of mind, mm, of mm, the mental impurities or defilements. So in fact, it is a book on meditation, a handbook of meditation uh, written by a monk for monks. And when he wrote this book, he assumed a knowledge of Abhidhamma, of his readers. So <coughs> it is not so easy in some places to understand this book uh, without a knowledge of Abhidhamma. So the purpose in writing this book was just to help those who, want, who wanted to practice meditation. And the different types of meditation are explained in this book, and in some cases in a meticulous detail. <clears throat> and when he wrote this book, he followed the structure hinted by the Buddha in one of uh, his sudas, one of the sudas. And so the author picked one stanza from the Soda Bhideka, from the Samyutta Nikaya, and that stanza is given at the beginning of the book. And following that stanza, and following the, let us say, the blueprint, Buddha's blueprint uh, for spiritual development, he structured this book. Now, uh, there are three, three stages in Buddha's develop, uh, plan for spiritual development. Uh, the first is sila, S-I-L-A, and the second is samadhi, and the third is panya. The first is, uh, let's call virtue following this translation. The first is virtue, the second is concentration, and the third is understanding or wisdom. And sila or vaju is the foundation on which uh, sama samadhi, uh, concentration, and wisdom are built. Without the foundation of sila, uh, there can be no concentration. And without the concentration, there can be no panya or penetration into the nature of things. So these three stages of de development are to be practiced uh, one after the other. <coughs> So the, the other uh, Bodhagas have followed this. So sila or virtue is described in the first two chapters. 
The first one deals <coughs> with sila, and the second chapter deals with uh, what we call ascetic practices, that is, f- for the further purification of sila or virtue. And then from chapter 3 to chapter 13, the samadhi or concentration is explained. And in these chapters, the 40 subjects of tranquility meditation are explained in detail. And the last two chapters in this part uh, give the benefits of the, con- uh, the tranquility or serenity meditation. And from chapter 14 to chapter 22, that is chapter 22 is the end of the book. Panya, or wisdom, or understanding, is described. And in chapters 14 to chapter 17, a theoretical theoretical knowledge of the the aggregates, bases, faculties, truths, and so on are explained, and the description of practice of vipassana begins with chapter 18 going up to chapter 21 and the last chapter chapter 22 explains the benefits of the practice of mental culture or vipassana <coughs> we have 23 chapters 23 yeah the benefits are chapter oh. 23 mm-hmm. 22 is Oh, up to 22. Right. Oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the last one is uh, 23, chapter 23, Benefits of Vipassana. And there are two editions of this book in Pali in uh, Roman or Latin script. One was published by the Pali Tech Society of London and the other by Harvard University. I think you, you have the copy of Harvard University edition here. This one? No, in Pali, I mean. Oh, in Pali. Yes. Yeah. So Which there are two editions of uh, the original book in Roman script. And the edition of PTS was published in 1920, 1921. Older than all of us here, right? <laughs> oh, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and half an edition was uh, published in 1950. And there are two English translations of this monumental work. The first one was uh, by a Burmese Burmese layman called Pei Mountain, who was also the author of the translation of the first commentary of Abhidhamma, Atasalini. It, it is called Expositor. So, Pei Mountain's translation came first and it was published in 1923. And the second translation called The Path of Purification was done by Jnana Moli. The name was given, yeah, yeah, Bhikkhu Jnana Moli. He was an English, Englishman who became a Buddhist monk after the war, and he lived all his um, years as monk in Sri Lanka. And when he was, when he was uh, doing this translation, I, I, I was in Sri Lanka. And when it came out in 1956, I was there. So there are two English translations, and many people think that this is a better translation. Well, I don't know. (laughs) We'll have to see. (coughs) Now, uh, we are going to cover only uh, three chapters in in eight weeks, and then maybe we'll, we'll pick up the other chapters next year. And they are altogether 120 pages. And so 
we'll have to do about 15 pages each week. That means you, you'll, you'll have to read three pages a day. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I want you to really read uh, the, the, uh, before you come to the class, because I think we cannot go uh, in detail reading from the beginning to the end of uh, and this book, because we, we won't be able to finish 15 uh, pages in an hour, because I'll, I'll have to explain some of uh, the difficult points uh, in this book. So we will do uh, three, three chapters in eight weeks. And the first chapter deals with uh, virtue or sila. Unfortunately, it is a sila of monks. You know, this book was written for monks, and so the first chapter deals with exclusively with uh, virtue or sila for monks. And the purification of sila is very much emphasized uh, in, this, in this chapter or in this book. And there's a saying current in, Bur in Burma that if, uh, if a monk studies Visodhimaga and after he has studied, he would either disrobe or go into the forest and practice meditation. <laughs> Because sila has to be to be kept uh, in a very pure, and it, it is very difficult to, to keep all the uh, precepts to uh, to keep the, all the precepts pure, and so some may uh, get disillusioned or afraid of uh, being impure and may disrobe. Or if you are a really a really good monk, then you will keep the silas and you will go to the forest and practice meditation. So not all monks study it. <laughs> Actually, monks study it. <laughs> all monks? Yes. Because uh, if, if you are interested in meditation, then you have to study it. Because the instructions for meditation are given in this book in detail. And everybody, or every monk uh, who wants to practice meditation has to have at least some acquaintance with this book even though they may not have read uh, through the book, uh, deep, uh, relying on their teachers, at least they have read some portion of the book. So this is a handbook of um, meditation teachers as well as uh, students of meditation. So the first chapter deals with the virtue of monk. Uh, the first, uh, at first, the the other gave us a stanza from Sanyukta Nikaya, and basing on this stanza, he he planned this book and he wrote on the basis of this stanza, which describes sila, samadhi, and panya. When a wise man established well in virtue, develops consciousness and understanding. Then, as a bhikkhu ardent and sagacious, he succeeds in disentangling this tangle. So this is the stanza put at the beginning of this book. And this stanza was in response to a question asked by a deity. So the deity asked Buddha, the inner tangle and the outer tangle. This generation is entangled in the tangle. And so I ask of Gautama this question, who succeeds in disentangling this tangle? <laughs> and then the, the explanation of the, this stanza was given below. And if you read, when you read <coughs> this book, you will have a glimpse, at least a glimpse, of how uh, Pali commentaries are written. This, there, there are what explanations, and then some comments mm, on it. So when you see mm, what's in italic, then this is the word which appears in the original, original Pali text, or here uh, or in, in the original stanza. So tango is a term for the network of craving. Actually, craving is compared to a tango here. So when we have craving, 
then we are entangled in different things. So, tangled is a term for the network of craving. <clears throat> and the deity asked how this tangle of craving could be disentangled. And then Buddha's answer was, first, you are to be well established in virtue and sila, in moral conduct. And then you develop consciousness. Here, consciousness really means samadhi. So samadhi is described as consciousness here. And then you develop understanding of panya. Then as a bhikkhu, ardent and sagacious, he succeeds in disentangling this tangle. That means uh, you develop samadhi, you practice samatha meditation, and then you develop understanding, that is, you practice vipassana meditation. And if you practice vipassana meditation, you will succeed in um, disentangling this tangle, or you will succeed in destroying uh, this craving. And when craving is destroyed, craving is eradicated, then there will be no tangle of uh, craving. So Buddha gave or uh, Buddha taught this deity to first to be well established in virtue and then practice meditation or samadhi and then understanding or panya or vipassana. So uh, vipassana and panya are synonymous and samadhi and here chaita are synonymous or samadhi and samatha are synonymous. And then the author describes how he is going to, to write this book. So the purification should be understood as Nibbana. So purification really means Nibbana, which being devoid of all stains is utterly pure. The path of purification is the path to that purification. It is the means of approach that is called the path. Now, there may be some some places where I would like to make corrections or um, suggest a better translation. So here, uh, paragraph 5, the path of purification is a path to that purification. It is a means of approach. I think uh, we should see a means of attainment that is called the path. But the Pali word adhigama is used in the sense of attainment, reaching. So it is better to say a means of attainment that is called the path. The meaning is I shall expound that path of purification. And that path of purification is taught sometimes by insight alone, that is by vipassana alone. And according as it is said, now always uh, the the others, the ancient others are very conscious of what we call authority. So whatever he said, he must have some proof of his uh, authenticity. So he always refer to the the, the, the <coughs> statements in the text or in the Pali books in the Pitagas. So here the the other uh, took this out of the. So, the, so, so does and give as a proof of his authenticity. Formations are all impermanent when he sees thus with understanding and turns away from what is ill that is a path to purity. Now here vipassana is meant. So sometimes the path of purification is taught by insight or vipassana only. And in some instances by jhana and understanding according as it is said. Here jhana means tranquility meditation and understanding means vipassana meditation. So sometimes the path is taught by jhana and uh, by samatha and vipassana. He is near unto nibbana in whom are jhana and understanding. That is uh, from Dhammapada. <coughs> so here jhana means samatha meditation and this will be described in great detail in the coming chapters. 
and in some instances by deeds or by karma, etc., according as it is said, by deeds, vision, and righteousness, by virtue, the sublime is life. By these are mortals purified and not by lineage or wealth. So in this stanza, uh, karma, and then vision, righteousness, virtue, and life sublime are described as a way to purification. So when Buddha taught uh, people, he taught in different ways, uh, uh, depending on depending on the capability of his listeners. So in some instances, by virtue, etc., according as, as it is said, he who is possessed of constant virtue has understanding and is concentrated. So here, virtue, understanding, and concentration is strenuous, so energy or effort, and diligent as well will cross the flood, so difficult to cross. And in some instances, by the foundations of mindfulness, sometimes the path is described um, by foundations of mindfulness, uh, because this path is the only way for the purification of beings and so on. And similarly, in the case of right efforts and so on, sometimes by way of uh, right efforts, or sometimes by way of <coughs> faculties and others. But in the answer to this question, it is taught by virtue and the other two. So here, in this stanza, the, the stanza mentioned at, at the beginning of the book, that the path is described or taught by virtue, concentration, and wisdom. <clears throat> and then a detailed explanation of the of the stanza is given. Uh, paragraph 7. Established well in virtue, a man, wise, develops consciousness and understanding and so on. Now, uh, let's see the explanation of the word wise. Possessing the kind of understanding that is born of karma, by means of a rebirth linking with triple root cause. <laughs> you understand that? Understanding that is born of karma. That is the result of karma. By means of a rebirth linking with triple root cause. You are familiar with roots, right? Loba. Those are uh, moha, and then opposite of these three, aloba, adosa, amoha. Now, uh, a relinking consciousness, relinking consciousness can be accompanied by aloba and adosa, two roots, or by three roots, aloba, adosa, and amoha. When it is accompanied by three roots, uh, a person is called a three-root person, and only these three-root persons can can um, become enlightened in that particular life. If if we are, if our relinking consciousness is accompanied by only two roots, um, non-attachment and non-hatred, then we cannot hope to gain enlightenment in this life. Okay. So here. Uh, develops consciousness and understanding, then uh, a, a wise man means a man who is uh, born with three roots, including uh, understanding or wisdom, amoha. Loba is attachment. Dosa is, uh, dosa is hatred. Moha is uh, delusion or ignorance. <coughs> and then the opposite of these three, a loba, a dosa, and a moha. And only uh, the last three roots, or two or three of the last three roots, accompany a relinking consciousness. So if you, if you remember the, the diagram of relinking, I mean, uh, dead, dead and relinking thought process, 
you see there is the relinking consciousness, patisandhi. And that consciousness is accompanied by uh, some mental factors. So among them, there may be all three, uh, three good roots or two roots. So if a person is reborn with the relinking consciousness accompanied by three roots, then he is said to be wise here and develops consciousness and understanding, develop, develops both concentration and insight. That means practice both uh, samatha and vipassana meditation. And on page four, he has, he has that, thus he is ardent. Sagacious, it is understanding that is called sagacity. I don't know what sagacious means. Possessing that is the meaning. This is what shows protective understanding. Actually, here understanding means some kind of clear comprehension. Clear comprehension of what is beneficial and clear comprehension of what is suitable. So that is called understanding here. So. Rather than saying protective understanding, we should say understanding um, engaged in keeping meditation. That means when you practice meditation, uh, you, have to, you have to know which is beneficial and which is not, and which is suitable and which is not. So you have to keep this understanding or wisdom with you always when you practice meditation. And that is what is meant here. And about four lines down, we have, he sees fear by Yam Ikadi in the round of rebirth. Thus, he is a bhikkhu. Now, a bhik, uh, the word bhikkhu is um, translated as a monk. And as I said, most of the Buddhas, Sudhas are uh, taught to monks. And so you will find um, Buddha addressing monks, monks. And in one of the Sudhas, in the, in the, so does on the foundations of mindfulness, the commentary explains that anybody who practices meditation and who sees danger in, in existence can, call, can be called a bhikkhu, a monk. Because bhikkhu can be derived from bhi and ikku. Bhi here means uh, fear or danger and ikka means to see. So one who sees danger <coughs> in the existence can be called a bhikkhu. So in, in this case, not only ordained monks, anybody who sees danger in, in, in the existence of becoming is called a bhikkhu, or can be called a bhikkhu. And such a person will be able to, uh, to cut this tangle off and become an arahant. So by, the, uh, by this stanza, uh, Buddha shows many things, uh, three trainings and dispensation that is good in three ways and so on. They are also all explained uh, later. The dispensation of Buddha is said to be good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. So, why is it good in the beginning? Because, the, uh, because of the passage which says, what is the beginning of profitable things? Profitable here means wholesome, kusala. Now, different authors have different translations for, for Pali words. So, uh, I, I prefer unwholesome, but the, the, the translator here preferred maybe profitable. So, profitable things means wholesome things virtue that is quite purified. And because of the passage beginning, the not doing of any evil. Virtue is the beginning of the dispensation. So sila is the beginning of Buddha's dispensation or Buddhist religion. And that is good because it brings about the special qualities of non-remorse and so on. Now, sila is conducive to uh, feelings of non-remorse because when one's moral conduct is pure, one does not uh, suffer from uh, guilt, feelings, or remorse. So the 
the benefit of a pure sila, pure virtue is uh, non-remorse. And well, what I meant by, and so on. <laughs> one, one leads to another, right? So, on page, uh, on paragraph, in paragraph 32, we, 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 we read this. Uh, about four lines down. Discipline is for the purpose of restraint. Restraint is for the purpose of non-remorse. So when we have restraint, uh, we do not have <coughs> regrets. So we are free from regrets. And non-remorse is for the purpose of gladdening. When there is non-remorse, we are glad. Gladdening is for the purpose of happiness. Gladdening is a, a weaker form of happiness, and happiness is a greater form of happiness. So this happiness leads to tranquility. Only when there is happiness of both uh, happiness here means uh, comfort, also means comfort. So happiness of uh, mind and comfort of the body. So happiness leads to tranquility, and tranquility is for the purpose of bliss, sukha. So sukha is trans uh, translated as uh, bliss here. Uh, tranquility is the, the pasadi. You've come across these words in, in the 52 JD seekers, the tranquility of mental uh, mental body, tranquility of physical body, and uh, not physical body, tranquility of jeta. So tranquility uh, is for the purpose of bliss, and bliss is for the purpose of concentration. And concentration is for the purpose of correct knowledge and vision, and so on. So for the purpose of concentration, we need bliss. Bliss here means uh, comfort or peacefulness. So when, when, when there is no peacefulness, we cannot get concentration. And so it leads step by step to uh, ultimately to liberation from all, all suffering and extinction of all suffering and also extinction of the mental defilements. Then, concentration is the middle of the Buddha's dispensation. because of the passage beginning, entering upon the profitable. Here also, the usual translation is cultivating what is wholesome or what is good. Do you remember a, a stanza I talked about maybe in the second or f first or second a bit of my lecture? Uh, there is a stanza or verse in Dhammapada uh, which describes the, the, in very brief way the teachings of the Buddhas, and that is not to do any evil, to cultivate what is good, and to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. So the, the, the author here is referring to, uh, to that <coughs> stanza. So entering upon the profitable means cultivating what is wholesome. That is, it is the uh, middle of the dispensation because it means concentration. And that is good because it brings about the special qualities of supernormal power and so on. So when you have concentration, you can get uh, jhanas and also supernormal powers. Its goodness in the end is shown by understanding. So understanding or knowledge or wisdom is the, is the uh, highest stage. And so... <coughs> It is a goodness in the end. Because of the best, the purifying of one's own mind. This is the Buddha's dispensation. And because understanding is its culmination, understanding is the end of the discipline. So understanding here means penetration of um, four noble truths. <coughs> and the paragraph 11, likewise the necessary condition for the triple clear vision is shown by virtue. Do you know the triple clear vision? They are given in the footnotes. So the sila, uh, <coughs> the, the necessary condition for, a sila is the necessary condition for the triple clear vision. That is, 
recollection of past lives, knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings, and knowledge of destruction of uh, mental defilements. The, these three are called triple clear vision. Actually, they are the supernormal, supernormal knowledge. They, they also belong to supernormal knowledge. <coughs> For with the support of perfected virtue, one arrives at the three kinds of clear vision, but nothing besides that. The necessary condition of the six kinds of direct knowledge is shown by concentration. So six kinds of direct, direct knowledge are also given in the footnotes. And three of them are the same as the clear vision. So knowledge of supernormal power, that means uh, to perform some miracles, the divine ear, penetration of minds, that means uh, reading minds of others, recollection of past lives, knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings, and knowledge of destruction of cankers. <clears throat> the necessary condition for the categories of discrimination is shown by understanding. It's very difficult to understand this word. Discrimination, categories of discrimination. What do you understand by that? Actually, it is a kind of understanding, understanding of the, um, let, let, let us follow the, uh, the footnote first, understanding of the <coughs> meaning, understanding of the law, law means Dharma, his teachings, understanding of the language and understanding of the, the wisdom or intelligence. These four are called the discriminative knowledge in Pali Pati Sambhita. That means the penetrative knowledge of, of, the, of these four. And the first, meaning. It is, it is, uh, meaning is, is only given in the footnote. But in fact, it can mean also, um, also the something which arises out of something. That is, something which arises depending on some other thing. So, um, it is a result or effect. <coughs> <coughs> and instead of law, uh, we, can, we can interpret this, uh, it, it to mean the cause. And also, the the, the the words of his teachings. And language is just language. And here, according to Theravada <coughs> interpretation, it is a, the uh, original language or Pali language. You know, everybody wants his language to be the, the, the or original language of hu humanity. <laughs> so, uh, the, those, those, uh, who are brought up in the in the tradition of Pali thinks that Pali is the original language. So Pali was used by uh, the the people who appeared in the uh, in, in the world in the beginning. And the people who, who who are brought up under the Sanskrit tradition say Sanskrit is the the original language of human human beings. <laughs> so here. Um, Language means Pali language, and intelligence means just the understanding or our wisdom. <coughs> so, uh, the many things are shown by just this one verse, or. We are, we are really not sure whether Buddha meant all these, but the commentators are very fond of explaining in many ways a single teaching or a single verse of the Buddha. <coughs> now, in paragraph 12, likewise the means for surmounting the states of loss. Now, the states of loss means the states of war, the state of misery, the four apayas, the animal kingdom, hell, uh, angry ghosts, and, and another kind of ghosts. 
the means for surmounting the element of sense, sense desires by concentration. Uh, do you know the element of sense desires? What do you understand by that? Right? No. <laughs> element of sense desires here means the world of sense desires, karma, vajra, loga. The word used is, uh, the Pali word used here is dhadu. And dhadu is uh, normally translated as element. So he translated, uh, translated it as element of sense desires. But it, it, it doesn't convey the, the, the intended meaning. So in, in Pali we have the word kama dhadu, rupa dhadu, and aruba dhadu. Kama dhadu means just uh, the realms of sense desire. That is, a uh, human world and six lower celestial worlds and the four uh, states of war. They are called uh, karma dhatu. So here, I think instead of the element, we should say the worlds of sense desires. That, that, that makes more sense. Ms. Narana, for those of you people who don't have books, I sort of would like to read the question and the answer again so uh-huh. they get the connection. Is that okay if Good. I do that? Good, yes. Okay. So the question that the commentary is answering is, the inner tangle and the outer tangle, this generation is entangled in a tangle. And so I ask of Gotoma this question, who succeeds in disentangling this tangle? And then the answer to that is what we've been discussing a little bits of, which is when a wise...